Morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. Beautiful day. Um, special welcome if you're a visitor. And uh, my name is Matthew. I'm going to be leading our service this morning. Most of you know me. Uh, first up, some notices this week because it's the Easter holidays. There's no Bible study. There's no visit to Ray Oakland, although there's a meeting um, for those involved. Who, you'll know about that. Um, there's no toddlers, so it's, it's a quiet week because it's the holidays, chance to relax, to recuperate, um, chance to uh, spend some time together less formally as well and encourage each other. Um, I have a formal notice to read as well for the ATM. Notice is hereby given that the Home Church Annual General Meeting will be held on Sunday the 28th of April, so that's three weeks' time, here at St. Luna Museum, in fact in the very rooms. Uh, the running order for the day will be as follows. We're going to have a Sunday service as normal at half ten. Then we'll have our refreshments after the service. But then at twelve, we'll be um, having a church family lunch. Uh, so please sign up on the sheets so we know numbers. You are welcome to that whether or not you're staying for the AGM. And, um, and then at 12.45, so it'll be a fairly quick lunch. And then we'll be back in here for the AGM with tea and coffee and cake um, to work through business, but also look back over the past year and uh, see what encouragements there are, look forward to the next year and um, discuss how we move forward with making the gospel known in Warzone. So everyone's welcome, both for lunch and the meeting, you don't have to be a member to come to the AGM. Uh, the only thing you need to be a member for is to vote on the electoral roll. So if you do want to have a vote um, and you're not yet on the electoral roll, do sign up. There's forms out on the table out there. Um, and we're going to be electing, one of the things we'll be voting on is to elect a new church council um, at that AGM. So the nominees are Pam Bell, Norma Bingham, Claire Clark, Helen Keeler, Guy Letts, Lindsay Letts, Jackie Mitchell, Steve Mitchell, Julia Sanders and Michelle Starfall. If I've just read out your name that's a surprise, <laughs> <laughs> something's gone wrong in the, in the process and do talk to Helen because you, you should know if you've been nominated. Um, there are enough church council seats for all of those nominees. So at the moment, they'll be elected on block at the AGM, that group of people. If you have any feedback about those nominations, um, do please talk to me or Ben or John um, to say if you have any concerns about any of those names. But otherwise, those will be the names that are the church council. If you're not able to come to the meeting, but you still would like to have your opinion heard, then um, please express your wishes in writing. Talk to Helen about you. The agenda's been sent out. You should know what we're going to be talking about. Uh, if not, if you'd like to see an agenda, um, talk to Helen. And if you'd like to express an opinion on those, if Helen gets it in writing, we'll make sure that that's either registered as a vote or your, your opinion is, um, is aired and shared at that meeting you're not able to be there. So uh, I think that's the formal notice that I had to give over. Did I cover everything? Yeah, and um, just to remind people that the sheet's outside for the lunch, so if you yeah. sign up. Sign up for lunch. It would be lovely to know how many we've got, uh, just so we don't massively over-cater or under-cater, um, and sign up if you're free food for that. And then final notice, just long, don't get diaries, because people have started asking me. Um, we're going to be having our day away in Wooler again, same as last year. It's the 6th of July. I know that's not a great day <coughs> for um, Luke and Fiona Parker from West End Community Church are going to be with us. So I'm looking forward to that. I haven't got much more planned than that. So if you have strong ideas about what you would like included or would not like included, please do talk to me. Um, because planning is about to start in earnest for that. So 6th of July would be a wedding one. That's a Saturday. And I think that's all noticed. Is there anything else I should have mentioned? Great. We'll start the service properly. Um, it's the week after Easter, if you hadn't noticed. And we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and we continue celebrating all year round. This is what the Apostle Peter, uh, reflecting on the implications of the resurrection, wrote. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Through the resurrection... Peter says, believers in Jesus have been given a new birth, a living hope, an inheritance that will never fail. So let's praise the Almighty God together now in the words of our first hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty God. <coughs> 
Amen. 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 And you can see the words. To sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. So if, like me, you fail to love God, or fail to love others to that standard, then in God's sight we are the wicked, and we need to confess that to him and seek his forgiveness and help to do what's just and right. Let's join together in those words, these words to do that together. We pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault. In his thoughts, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and help us to serve you in the years of our life. To the glory of your name. Amen. For the great news of the Gospel, Jesus promises 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. While our actions, our hearts, are turned against God and our wicked, Jesus promises that if we come to him, he will forgive us, he will restore us, he will give us new hearts that desire to follow him, and he will give us rest and comfort. To those who come to him and promise to serve him, to take on his yoke, that's what that means, Jesus promises he will remain with us, he will give us his rest. Our next team celebrates those promises. So let's stand together to sing, stand if you're able to sing, oh Jesus I have promised.
question, which is, why did the religious leaders want the soldiers to lie about what took place at the tomb? Why did the religious leaders want the soldiers to lie about what took place at the tomb? So as I read, you can be thinking about what the answer to that might be. The guards at Jesus' tomb were in for a surprise on Easter morning. Just as the sky was starting to lighten, the earth began shaking violently and a mighty angel of the Lord appeared. His face shone like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The terrified guards fell to the ground as if dead. In an instant, the angel rolled the stone away from the mouth of the tomb and sat on it. Jesus, alive, walked out of the tomb. He had risen from the dead, just as he said he would. By the time the soldiers came to their senses, the tomb was open and empty. They ran the mile back to Jerusalem and breathlessly told the religious leaders what had happened. The chief priests and Pharisees offered the soldiers a deal. If they would lie about Jesus' body, saying that the disciples had stolen it during the night, they would receive money in return. It seemed like an easy solution, but the soldiers felt conflicted. What if the governor found out that they'd been sleeping on the job? They would be in so much trouble. Sensing their hesitation, the religious leaders promised the soldiers protection. They assured them that they had no reason to worry, their jobs would remain secure. If word ever made it back to the governor, they would take care of things. They simply had to lie about what had happened at the tomb. So the soldiers did. They lied and took the money from the chief priests and Pharisees. And today, many people still believe the false claim that Jesus' body was stolen from the tomb. At about the same time, just after sunrise, some women who were friends of Jesus arrived at the tomb in the garden. They were carrying fragrant spices and perfumes to anoint Jesus' body. The women had been worrying about how they would ever be able to move that stone that had been set in front of the tomb opening. It was enormous and probably weighed as much as a horse. Imagine their surprise when arriving at the tomb they found the stone rolled away. As they cautiously peered into the carved stone entrance, they saw the linen cloths in which Jesus' body had been wrapped. But the body was gone. Suddenly, two shining angels appeared. The women, alarmed and afraid, bowed their faces to the ground. The angel said, don't be afraid. Jesus was crucified, but he's not here. He's alive. <coughs> Remember how he said he would be crucified, but then would rise from the dead on the third day? Now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he's alive and that you will all soon see him in Galilee. The women, still trembling, but now joyful, hurried back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples everything they'd seen and heard. So, why did the religious leaders want the soldiers to lie about what took place? Go with me. Because um, they wanted the soldiers to lie about what From Psalm 107. Some went out on the sea in ships. There were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high. 
by the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Sunday after Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put, a, put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Father God, we, thank, we give thanks for the opportunities to reach out to the community here in Wall's End. We thank you for the response to our Good Friday Easter Gardens events and the Easter Trail event, and the chance to share something of the light, <coughs> joy, and peace, and hope of Easter. We pray for all the families who attended, and we pray that you will help them to remember your sacrifice, and open their hearts to follow your ways. Look favourably, Lord God, on our work, here, work and ministry here in Moore's End, that by trusting in your power, our witness may reflect your light in the communities in which we live and work, and that the eyes of more and more people will be opened, and that an increasing number will come to know Jesus, to call him Lord and God, and be brought to salvation. And Lord God, we pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for Palestinian Christians, we pray that love and peace will prevail in Gaza. We pray for your protection over families and homes. We pray that the war will end quickly and that you, Father, will meet the needs of all who suffer. We pray that your church can be the light in the middle of this total darkness and reflect the light and love of Christ in Gaza. And we pray also for Christians in Israel. Give them peace and protection, Father, so that their lives shine the light of Christ in an area that is so significant in Jesus' ministry on earth and in the history of our faith. We pray for an end to all violence and injustice in Israel and Palestine, Palestinian territories. We pray that you will comfort those have lost loved ones or who are waiting to hear about missing family and friends. And we pray also that the international community will work towards lasting peace in the Holy, Mount, Holy Land. And we pray that the churches might be a beacon of hope through their testimony in words and actions. And we ask all these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus the righteous King. Amen. Amen. We'll end our prayers as David ends Psalm 118. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is love. He is good. His love endures forever. So shall we now say the Lord's
prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> said to the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen, as Lindsay read for us. He is not, uh, he's not among the dead anymore. He is alive, he is risen, and he is reigning at God's right hand. And that's one of the truths that we, um, we remember regularly when we join together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, uh, which Christians throughout the centuries and throughout the world have agreed on these foundational um, truths. So we're going to reaffirm our faith in God the Almighty Father, Jesus the King, and the Holy Spirit using the words of the Apostles' Creed um, now. Please stand and pray to John. And let's say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life of the Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Now you might have noticed, and have been too polite to ask, but uh, we have a, a list of lurking at the back. <laughs> um, we have two Ben's present today. So Ben Fright, uh, would you come up and um, tell us a bit about yourself while you're here and um, just who you are, where you come from? Not just a visitor, but a visitor in a dog club. Yeah. <laughs> I that one well, there. Um, my name's Ben, um, uh, I'm a minister over at St Joseph's in Benwell in the west end of Newcastle, and uh, we're also an Amy church, uh, so I know Ben it's been great to have some of you guys visit us uh, at points as well, um, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with you this morning. Um, uh, I guess as a minister you don't actually get to escape your church very often, so it's quite nice to visit somewhere else, so it's lovely to be with you, and it's been great to meet some of you this morning. Great, so... Um, how did you become a Christian? Um, so, what's that? My dad said you have to be. <laughs> yeah, so my dad's a minister as well. Yeah, so I said I, would, I, I promised I would never become a minister. Um, that's great. Yeah. But uh, um, there, uh, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, my dad's a minister at Jasmine Parish Church. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I had the privilege of being taught the gospel from a young age uh, and kind of believed it growing up. But I think. Um, uh, when I went off to university, I, I kind of questioned my faith a lot, um, went through some quite difficult things, and my sister's been very ill as I've been growing up, um, and still is really ill, um, and so that meant I really wrestled a lot with the question of suffering, and that kind of classic question, um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I had a lot of doubts at, at kind of the, the early years of university, and then through some great Christian folks and through uh, reading some really helpful books uh, I guess I came to believe that God can work through difficult times um, and uh, uh, that, that he so often does and that actually there's nothing else that can give us a, a certain hope, a solid foundation for life uh, and, and there's nothing in life that can insulate you from difficulty either and I guess I kind of hung out with some people at university you just seem to have everything sorted and you suddenly realise that actually they don't and they don't have this amazing foundation uh, that I've been given uh, in the gospel. That's great. And what are you thankful for at St. Joseph's at the moment? Uh, we've just had our eighth birthday, uh, so I'm thankful that we're, we're still there. Uh, when we started, everything felt very uncertain. We didn't know what it was going to be like. 
Um, so I'm really thankful uh, that we're still going, that we've grown a bit. Um, uh, I think kind of in terms of what I'm particularly thankful at the moment, um, thankful for at the moment, um, uh, I guess this past year I've, I've had the privilege of walking alongside some folks who are uh, facing up to death or, or going through some really difficult times um, and uh, I'm just thankful for them walking, persevering with the Lord. Um, I think I so often find as a minister meeting with folks who are going through difficult times that uh, I I kind of leave feeling like it's been a privilege to spend time with them and I feel ministered to you so often rather than the other way around. Um, and so I'm thankful for them. That's great. And we're very appreciative of uh, you coming to preach the Chamber of Word today. Um, uh, Joanne often comes and um, gives Mary a break um, on the piano. And the support we've had for some donors. How can we support you with um, what can we be doing for you? Um, uh, I guess the biggest thing is, is prayer. Um, we'd always value your prayers. Um, uh, we're at a stage where we're thinking about planting a, a new church, uh, which is exciting, but uh, feels quite daunting at the same time. And there's a lot of unknowns, and we don't know where it's going to be yet. We don't know who it's going to be. Uh, might be me leading it, might be someone else. Uh, but I guess personally, that leaves us as a family feeling a little bit unsettled. We're not sure whether we're going to be at St. Joseph's in a year's time, uh, but we might be there for the next eight years. I'm not, I'm not kind of wanting to leave in any sense, but being like, maybe maybe that's what God's calling me to. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll just find your prayers for guidance, I think, as we as we think about that and pray about that. Thanks. Thank you. I'll jump right in, Alan. Yeah, and then um, yeah. we will proceed. But yeah, Lord, thank you for the partnership we've got with St. Joseph's, for the um, support we have through to Amy and the shared convictions and the desire to make you know um, in this area and throughout our nation. And uh, for Ben and his family in particular, as they look to the future, pray for um, that you would comfort them that wherever uh, you would have them go um, to serve you, whether it's as part of this plant, wherever that is, or whether it's stay in St. Joseph's, that you are with them, that you are constant, uh, you are the solid foundation that they can build their lives on. Uh, whatever else changes around, the one thing we can be sure of is, is that there will be change and that um, you will still be sovereign through that change. And pray that you would uh, bless the words that Ben has for us today, that there would be an encouragement um, for us to keep going, to keep serving you, and not to be afraid. Amen. And our next hymn is um, before Ben and I to preach. Give them a breather while we sing. Um, our next hymn, there is so much we don't know. There's so much we can't be sure of for the future. Uh, but there are some things we can build our hope on that's rock solid. So we're going to sing now of um, I Cannot Tell, um, which is all about things we don't know, but the things that we can be absolutely sure of and uh, build our future on. So let's stand to sing together I Cannot Tell.
breakfast, feeling like uh, we're ready to go to bed. <laughs> so, uh, it was an interesting birthday. Uh, but fear does so easily take hold, doesn't it? Uh, we see that in the story uh, in Matthew's Gospel. Um, but it's something much more serious uh, here in, uh, in, in what we've just read, isn't it? Uh, the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee uh, in a boat with Jesus. Uh, and we're told, verse 24, that suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake. Uh, so the waves swept over the boat. Uh, and the disciples, they, they wake Jesus, uh, terrified, saying, Lord, uh, don't you realise what's going on? Uh, save us, we're going to drown. We know that uh, some of the disciples were experienced fishermen, weren't they? Uh, and so they were used to heavy seas and rough waves. Uh, this wasn't a minor storm or some sort of overreaction. They were overcome with fear. Uh, it had gripped the boat. You could say fear is in the boat. Uh, maybe they start to imagine themselves floundering in the water. Uh, maybe they start to think of their family back home or their kids. Fear has taken hold in that boat, hasn't it? Uh, and it so easily does. Fear takes away our strength. Uh, it stops us doing things, doesn't it? Uh, it can leave us feeling hopeless. Uh, it can be crippling. Uh, now, we might not feel an immediate sense of fear right now uh, in this room, uh, like that story. Uh, but we all have certain fears, don't we, in life? Uh, a lot has happened in the last few years for you as a church family. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot to give thanks for. Uh, but there have also been challenges out there. Uh, and maybe there have been challenges in your personal lives as well. Uh, maybe you've lost some dearly loved members of the church family even over the last few years. So what are the next two years going to look like for Hope Church? Uh, the first two years can feel exciting, uh, but then you settle into the normal realities of church life, uh, and thinking about the longer term. Uh, what if you feel that it's right to buy a building? Uh, it sounds like there might be a building coming up, fantastic, uh, but how are you going to manage all that extra work that might bring having a building? <coughs> uh, or, or what if you just can't find a building? What's going to happen then? Uh, looking up Looking ahead, it throws up a lot of different questions, doesn't it? Uh, maybe God will provide some amazing gospel opportunities for you in the community. Uh, but maybe that will feel like a real stretch with the resources that you've got. Uh, and what is the next few years going to look like for you personally? Uh, even just this last month, uh, we've had folks with difficult medical diagnoses at St. Joseph. <coughs> uh, there are people like that every single year. Yeah. We've reminded in our uh, sermon series at St. Joseph's and Ecclesiastes that nothing in life is certain uh, apart from how life will end. I don't know what fears come to mind for you as I talk about those things or how you respond to fear. Uh, it can make us quiet and despondent, can't it? Uh, it can make us noisy and complaining. Uh, or we try to drive it away with bold words and optimism. But we all have fears. Now I don't want to put a downer on your Sunday morning bringing up all those things. Uh, because what I want us to see really uh, as we look at this passage is that we can take heart. Uh, whatever our fears, even in the face of uncertainty, uh, even in the midst of any storm that might come over the next two years. Because do you see what Jesus says next to his disciples? Uh, the storm is raging around them, the water is swamping into the boat. <laughs> and the disciples meet Jesus and say, Lord, save us, we're going to drown, we're going to die. Uh, and Jesus, who has been sleeping, seemingly totally at peace, says to them, You have little faith, why are you so afraid? Uh, in some ways, it seems a ridiculous thing to say, doesn't it? It's uh, almost annoying. Why are we afraid, Jesus? Uh, have you seen what is going on? But actually, it's the disciples who aren't seeing things clearly, isn't it? Jesus uh, doesn't say, are you, are you of no faith? 
uh, but you have little faith. Uh, Jesus uses this word little faith um, five times in the New Testament. And each time he's rebuking people for failing to hear or to get uh, what he is actually saying, uh, for failing to see who he really is and what he has come to do. Uh, and the disciples haven't really got who is with them in the boat of it. Up to this point, um, Jesus has been revealing more and more of his identity, identity to them. Uh, he has already done some incredible miracles. Uh, but the disciples haven't really grasped who he is. But as if in answer to his own question, why are you afraid? And we're told that Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And this, the lake was completely calm. Can you imagine the, the stillness in that boat? The quiet? Uh, in nature, but also amongst the disciples. Now, they must have been absolutely speechless, and maybe trembling even. Suddenly, it's not fear in the boat that is absorbing them. Uh, it's that Jesus is in the boat. And he is so much greater than fear. He is in complete control. He can completely turn things around. Uh, he is with us in the storm. He uses storms for his good purposes. Uh, and suddenly the, the disciples' eyes are, are not on themselves, on their own fears, uh, or the water that's spilling in the boats, or all the mighty waves they can see. No, their eyes are fixed on Jesus. They were told that they were amazed, saying, what kind of a man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And they saw him, at least in part, for who he really was, who he is. Uh, the Lord of creation, uh, their strong helper and saviour, one who is able to banish fear and give certain hope. Uh, and as we look ahead at the coming years, uh, whether we are in the eye of a storm right now, or whether we're just unsure what might lie ahead in the next few years, Jesus says to us to you have little faith. Uh, why are you so afraid? And he says, take your eyes off the boats, uh, yourself, your situations, your own fears, and fix them on me, fix them on Jesus. <coughs> See who is with you. And here's the um, Here's the prayer that I'd love us to pray together this morning um, when I finish uh, the sermon. I'd love us to pray this. Let us see you clearly, Lord Jesus, strong helper and saviour, that we might have peace and live courageously for you. And so we'll pray that together at the end. And that'd be a great prayer to pray as you look ahead to the next two years uh, as Hope Church family. But actually, maybe right now, uh, you might be thinking, hey, look, Ben, you, you don't really understand the storm that I'm in right now. And um, I probably don't. Uh, or maybe you just don't feel like Christ is in the boat with you. Uh, you haven't always had that experience of the storm suddenly being calmed like that. Uh, and the first thing I'd want to say to you is... Uh, I'm sure that you want to be a church family uh, who help one another through these sorts of times. Uh, so share that with someone in the church family and, and support one another. Uh, but we can also look at the example of the disciples, can't we? Uh, when the disciples were, were climbing into that boat at the edge of the lake, uh, they probably felt pretty confident, didn't they? I doubt they were afraid. Some of them were seasoned fishermen. It was just an everyday thing. Uh, the sea and the weather probably looked okay at that point and they feel that they are in control but after a bit things start to get outside of their experience uh, outside of their comfort zone uh, outside of their control uh, fear starts to grow within them their security is gone but you see faith doesn't rely on our own expertise and strength and it doesn't rely on favourable seeds uh, or calm, easy conditions. Faith relies on the Lord Jesus. 
And the truth is, when Jesus is in the boat with us, there will be storms. And he doesn't promise that the Christian life will be easy. It certainly wasn't easy for the disciples after this. But we can ask the Lord to strengthen our faith, even in the midst of storms. Uh, the apostles at one point say to Jesus, increase our faith, Lord. Uh, and his reply indicates that even a very small amount of faith, if it's genuinely trusting God, can do amazing things. Because it's not about the, the size of our faith, but about seeing more clearly who Jesus is. And the more we see Jesus clearly, the more that we will marvel at him, the more we'll be amazed by him like the disciples. And today we don't only look back at that miracle of Jesus calming the storm, uh, but we can look at the cross and we can say, yeah, what sort of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And yet he's willing to sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he prays, take this cup from me. He faces fear and yet continues forwards so that he can give his life for us at the cross. Uh, and he did that so that fear can be banished uh, so that we can have a certain hope even in the midst of storms. So that we can know with certainty that even if the very worst happens, Jesus loves us, he is with us, and he has made a way for us through death. One of my favourite uh, Bible verses is John chapter 16, verse 33. Uh, Jesus has told his disciples that there are going to be some really difficult times coming. And he's not going to be with them in person at that point. But he says to them, I have told you these things <coughs> so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, there will be days of darkness and trials, but Jesus understands, and he wants you to take heart, uh, because he has overcome the world. Now that's what we celebrated at Easter, isn't it? Uh, he has defeated fear and death, and given us the hope that one day we will see him face to face, and there will be no more suffering <coughs> or pain. Uh, but there will be groaning whilst we wait. Uh, but it is a hope-infused groaning, full of anticipation for what's ahead. And so we are to take heart, and uh, that's what I'd love us to do this morning. Uh, this should give us courage, and we have a hope that can banish fear. What might it look like to have that sort of hope and courage? Uh, well, back on uh, January the 30th, 1933, uh, you might know that Hitler uh, took over the German government and the Nazi party uh, um, took power in Germany. Uh, it was a time of great fear and anxiety for many, as you can imagine. Uh, and exactly two weeks before that date, on Sunday, January the 15th, uh, a German theologian and pastor called Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, preached on this exact passage. Uh, and he said this of Jesus' words, uh, it's up on the screen. You have little faith, why are you so fearful? In these words, we must hear all the disappointment of Jesus Christ in his disciples and all his love for them. Do you still not know that you are in God's hands, that where I am, God is? Why are you so fearful? Be of good courage, strong, firm, adult, sure, confident, not shaking with fear. Don't hang your heads. Don't complain about what bad times these are. I am in the boat, and Christ is here too in the name of this church. So why not hear him and believe him? Three years after that, in 1939, Bonhoeffer left a, a comfortable theological job in New York and boarded one of the last ships back to Germany in 1939, just before the war broke out. Uh, he was in a well-connected family, uh, and he knew the worst stories of what was happening in Germany. But he saw it as his duty to help. 
Bible. And he quoted Isaiah 28, verse 16 uh, in his journal when he headed back, uh, which is this, one who believes will not run away. Back in Germany, uh, he helped resist the Nazi regime, uh, he helped Jews out of the country, and he supported the church, and he wrote Christian books. But ultimately, it led him to prison, and he was arrested and sent to the gallows. And one author writes of him, what surfaces and sticks with us, especially in reading his letters, is the immense courage and hope he showed in what many consider the darkest times in the last century. It seems that Bonhoeffer knew what it was to hear Jesus' words and take heart. Now thankfully we are not called to stand up to the Nazis today, but I wonder what it would look like for us here today to see Jesus clearly and to live courageously for him trusting that he is with us uh, this year and over the coming years. What might that look like? As I said uh, earlier, back around 10 years ago when we started thinking about planting St. Joseph's, uh, it was exciting, uh, but there were a huge number of uncertainties. Uh, we didn't really know how it was going to go. Uh, it felt like an area we didn't really know very well uh, in the West End. Uh, we didn't know who would come along, whether anyone would join us. Uh, some people moved into the area and it felt like a big upheaval. Uh, but God gave people the faith and the courage to step out and to do that. Uh, and he's blessed us in ways that we couldn't even have imagined. Uh, and who knows how God might bless your willingness as a church family to step out of <coughs> faith uh, in the east end of the city. Uh, maybe God will take a, a, a seed that you planted uh, Maybe a child you've taught the gospel to. Uh, maybe a, a, a building that you've managed to secure. Uh, maybe he'll grow that seed into something that you can't even imagine right now. But it's easy to feel very weak and insignificant, isn't it? Or, or to look at the scale of the, the challenge uh, of holding out the gospel to the nations. And to feel a bit helpless or fearful. Uh, or um, defeatist or maybe feeling like we just don't have the resources or the people. Ultimately, it is God's work, isn't it? But he calls us to step out in faith, uh, not fear, uh, both together as a church family, uh, but also individually in our own lives. So will you pray for God to open doors and give you opportunities uh, personally, and will you boldly take the opportunities to share the gospel with those around you? And uh, will you pray for God to guide you as a church and for the right doors to open for you? And uh, will you trust God to provide rather than letting fear of the future hold you back? In all the ups and downs that come this year, we can trust that Jesus is with us uh, and we can take heart. We can know his peace which passes understanding. So will you be a church family that keeps reminding one another of these things? Uh, will you encourage one another? Will you spur one another on to be bold as you seek to hold out this amazing hope to those around you? It would be great to pray that those things would be true, wouldn't it? So why don't you just take a minute now to reflect on what we've looked at, uh, to pray. I'm just going to give you a minute. Uh, and then we'll pray that prayer that I mentioned earlier together to finish. So just take a minute now um, to reflect and to pray. Let's pray these words together uh, on the screen. Starting, let us see you. Let us see you clearly, Lord Jesus, strong and ever and faithful, that we might have peace and live courageously for you. Amen.
going to respond in song. Uh, the song <laughs> reminds us that uh, all of time is in God's hands, and His throne will stand forever. And we're in the good hands, and so we don't need to fear. So let's go on our feet. <laughs> Thank you for coming this morning. Mm-hmm.